We're starting a new Bible study in the book of 1 Samuel, and I'm really excited about this uh, book because it's got everything in it. It's got war, it's got, you know, friendship, it's got betrayal. It's, it's a, a, a transition time in the children of Israel. There's pretty much virtually anything and everything you could want, and in a book of the Bible, it's got it in 1 Samuel. It's got some of the most famous stories in the book of 1 Samuel, David and Goliath. We have the fact that we have the first king of Israel. We have all these great men in this book. We have some great warriors. We have some great battles. We have all these amazing things to draw off of from 1 Samuel. But I want to make special attention to note that the first chapter starts off with a different character. It starts off with a woman. And I think that's really important for us to get in our minds to realize, look, every great man of God had a mother. All of them, every single one of them has a mother and a mother has a very important role in the life of her child in the life of this world. And God's made it very important, the role of women. Women have an an incredibly tough job. They have a very important job. And today's society wants to break down barriers to motherhood, break down the barriers of what the role of a woman is according to the Bible. They want to attack the role of a woman and they want to make it something that it's not. They say that women only have importance if they're like a man. They got to get a job. They got to be independent. They got to do all these things just like a man would to have importance. That's what feminism teaches. Feminism teaches the more manly you are, the better woman you are. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches the more feminine you are, the more godly you are. God created women on purpose. He has a mission and a goal for their lives. And we see when we start the first book of Samuel, you got to remember, he starts it with a woman. He starts it with Hannah. Why? Because she's so crucial. She's so vital to this whole book. If Hannah didn't exist, the story would be a lot different. We would have a lot of different things happening because of Hannah, Hannah's decisions. We'll learn in this chapter. We'll see she sets off course one of the greatest books of the Bible, one of the greatest stories that will, you know, of history that we have recorded for us. So let's dig into this chapter. Let's make sure we give importance to the things that are important. Look at verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. So now, when we read this first beginning, we get a little bit of context. We get, where are we at? Well, we're learning about this, this person, okay, Elkanah. Now, keep your finger here and go to 1 Chronicles chapter number 6. 1 Chronicles chapter number 6. Now, when it gives his genealogy, it says that Zuf was an Ephrathite. Now, at first glance, when you read this, you would think, okay, so this guy's of Ephraim. He must be of the tribe of Ephraim. He must be of Joseph. That must be his lineage. But the reality is, is just because someone's called an Ephrathite doesn't necessarily mean that's their tribe. That could just be where they live. That could just be the area that they're in. Look at 1 Chronicles 6, verse 31. And these are they whom David set over the service of song in the house of the Lord after that the ark had rest. And they ministered before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of the congregation with singing until Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And then they waited on their office according to their order. And these are they that waited with their children of the sons of the Kohathites, he man a singer, the son of Joel, the son of Shemuel, the son of Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Eliel, the son of Toa, the son of Zuf the son of Elkanah, the son of Mahath, the son of Amasai, the son of Elkanah, the son of Joel, the son of Azariah, the son of Zephaniah, the son of Tehath, the son of Aser, the son of Abiasaph, the son of Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Koath, the son of Levi, the son of Israel. So we get a genealogy that goes all the way back unto Jacob, who is later named Israel. That's where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. And we see that this genealogy comes from Levi. So they are Levites by their genealogy. They're Levites by where God's ordained them to live and what they're supposed to do. Now, when you go through the Old Testament law, you see that the Levites have no inheritance. They have no portion in the inheritance of the Holy Land, of basically where God wants them to dwell in the land of Canaan. So where do they dwell? Well, they dwell among all of 
the tribes is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to be of every single tribe. They're supposed to be Levites in all the land. And as time goes through, you know, people shift from here to there. There's a lot of things that we go through the book of Judges. We see some people don't inherit all their land. We see the, the tribe of Dan does some weird stuff. So, but generally speaking, this is kind of how they started out. They started out, the tribes are kind of going to their different areas, but then the Levites are spread amongst all the different tribes. So when it's saying this guy of Zuff was an Ephrathite, it's not saying that he is of Ephraim. It's saying that's where he's dwelling. Because the Levites, you, you say, where are they dwelling? Well, it's telling us he's an Ephrathite. And we get such a long genealogy just to make sure who we know we're talking about. Because if you notice, when we read 1 Chronicles 6, it used Elkanah like three different times, didn't it? It said the son of Elkanah in verse 34, then in 35, the son of Elkanah, then in verse 36, the son of Elkanah. So, and you know, in the Bible times, a lot of times people use their grandfather's name. They'll use their dad's name. They, they use the same names over and over and over. So it gives us three, four, five different people in a row so you know exactly where you are in that timeline. Because if it just said, you know, uh, one or two of these people, it even uses another guy a couple times. He uses, uh, what, Joel, right? So we have Joel a couple times. We have Elkanah a couple times. So just to make sure we know exactly where we are, the Bible gives us enough of a genealogy to see that. And I think this is important because when we realize Samuel is going to become a great prophet of the Lord and he's ordained of God. But God didn't just ordain some random person from a random tribe. He ordained a Levite and specifically those of Kohath, those of the Kohathites. So go, if you would, to 1 Chronicles 23 now. Flip forward just a couple chapters. 1 Chronicles chapter 23. The Bible says of the sons of Levi, there was Gershon, Koath, and Merari. So he had three different sons. These sons are how the order of the Lord, the service of the Lord, was divided at that time. The Kohathites were those that were going to serve of the tabernacle of the congregation. So look at 1 Chronicles 23, verse 12. The sons of Koath, Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uzziel, four. The sons of Amram, Aaron, and Moses... And Aaron was separated that he should sanctify the most holy things, he and his sons forever, to burn incense before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name forever. So now go to Numbers chapter 3. And I want to just lay down a little bit of a quick foundation, just so we understand when we read the whole book of 1 Samuel, where these people are coming from. But we see Aaron and Moses were also from Kohath. They're of the Kohathites, and that's who God chooses to be the priest of of the most holy things, of the tabernacle, the priest that's going to go into the most holy place and offer the lamb. So these guys are considered the most separated unto the Lord of the Levites. Look at Numbers chapter 3, verse 25. So first we're going to learn those of Gershon. What did they do? It says, In the charge of the sons of Gershon and the tabernacle of the congregation shall be the tabernacle and the tent, the covering thereof, and the hanging for the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the Gershonites... They are still Levites, so they have some part of the service. But what is their part? They have the tent. They have the outward coverings. They're in charge of, you know, setting up the tent and the coverings. They're, they're going to do these type of things, hanging stuff over the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Skip to verse 36. And it says, And under the custody and charge of the sons of Merari shall be the boards of the tabernacle and the bars thereof and the pillars thereof and the sockets thereof and all the vessels thereof and all that serveth thereto. So we see they're all working in coordination. Basically, I would liken it to the Marae rites. They're showing up. They put the poles in the ground. They get the board set up. Then you have the Gershonites come. They lay over the tent coverings. They lay the hangings over the door. Then you have who? The Kohathites. They're the ones that actually have the instruments and the doing the sacrifices. Look at Numbers chapter 4 now. And look at verse number 3. From 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, all that enter into the host, to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath and the tabernacle of the congregation, about the most holy things. And when the camp setteth forward, Aaron shall come and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and the cover the ark of the testimony with it, and shall put therein the covering of badger skins, and shall spread over it a cloth holy of blue, and shall put in the staves thereof, and upon the table of the showbread, they shall spread a cloth of blue and put there on the dishes and the spoons and the bowls and covers to cover with all and the continual bread shall be thereon. So I'm just kind of giving a little bit of a quick, you know, overview. What do we have? We have the Gershonites. They've, they're the ones carrying the tent. 
They're carrying, you know, these coverings. Then you have the Rayrites. They're covering the boards and all the, the, the lumber and everything that's kind of for the sanctuary. Then you have the Kohathites. They're dealing specifically with the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. They're putting the staves in. They're the ones carrying it. They're, cover, they're the ones carrying the most holy things. And we see of this family of the Kohathites who are Levites, they're all Levites, this is where we get Samuel. We get Samuel from this line. He is of Kohath. So God, when he's going to pick somebody to do all these great things, be this great prophet of the Lord, he didn't just pick a random person. He's picking someone of a very elect group, not just Levites, but even of Kohath, those that were supposed to serve in the most holy things. So go back to 1 Samuel. I think that's just a good ground to lay so we understand, oh, is he of Ephraim? No, he's actually of Kohath when you study the genealogies. Look at verse number two. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice in the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. So I want to deal with a couple of things. We see Elkanah, he had two wives. And of these two wives, he had one with children, and he had one without any children, Hannah. But he sees that he loves Hannah, and the Bible makes it clear that the Lord had shut up her womb. And the reality is that the God is the one who opens and closes the womb. You say, how does someone get pregnant? The Bible says over and over and over, it's through God's hand. Now, we obviously understand through science and through just modern you know, education how a man and woman physically conceive, but we see that God's hand is in it. God's hand is in every conception. I believe every child is born from God's hand directly. He's the one opening and closing the womb. He's the one that's going to bless people with children. Now, obviously, if man and woman decide, you know, to intervene themselves, they can decide not to have children. But if you want children, God is going to be involved. Now, go to Genesis chapter number 20, if you would. Genesis chapter number 20. I want to make this point very clear that it's God that opens and closes the womb. And the thing is, is sometimes you'd look at a woman, maybe you could look at a Hannah of today. She doesn't have any children. And you could say, oh, it's because she's ungodly. It's because she's not a righteous person, because she has sin in her life. But the Bible doesn't teach this. The Bible doesn't teach that just because someone doesn't have children or the number of their children is a direct result of sin. Now, sometimes it can be. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to go too far to the extreme to say, well, you know, I'm taking birth control and God won't give me children. You know, OK, well, then you're you're doing a lot of things wrong there. But if the number of children you get is directly a blessing from God. It's directly in God's hand if you're doing everything right. Now look at Genesis chapter 20, verse 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So in this chapter, we see that Abram, he's basically not doing what God wants him to do. He takes his wife unto Egypt. We see that his wife is, you know, he says, it's just my sister. And it's possible that his wife's going to be taken by some other man. But the promise has been given to Abraham and Sarah to give Isaac. So the Lord intervenes. and He says, I'm going to close up all the wombs. No matter what happens, there's no other child coming out of Sarah but Isaac. Isaac is the one that is coming through. And we see God has the power to close up all the wombs of an entire city. This is great power. Go to chapter 29 now. Chapter 29. So we see this would be a result of being in sin, of not being according to God's will. God's saying, look, because y'all are in sin, I'm closing up wombs right now. Look at Genesis 29, verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So we see when there's two women that are also wives of Jacob. So we have another situation with a man and two wives. God is picking one of the wives to give her children. Go to chapter 30 now. Look at verse number 22. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her, and opened her womb. So, obviously, if you go to science class today, they're going to tell you how men and women get pregnant. 
But every time I'm reading my Bible, it's telling me God's the one that's choosing when people have children, when people don't have children. He's the one opening and closing the womb. He has the power to bless or to curse when it comes to the womb. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 now. Skip forward a couple chapters or a couple books in your uh, Bible to Deuteronomy chapter number 7. I'll read for you in Luke chapter number 1. It says in verse 5, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. So there's a couple in the Bible, in the New Testament specifically. The Bible says that they were blameless in the commandments. These people are doing right. They're following all of God's commandments, which means they're also doing that in science class, which is going to cause them to have children. But God's not blessing them. God's just not giving them the children, not because they're not righteous, because God had a special purpose for their life. And so if someone does not have children or has a small number of children, even though they're doing everything that the Bible says, you shouldn't look at it as a curse. You shouldn't look at it as something, well, you know, God just hates me. God doesn't, you know, whatever. God has, is divine. God is sovereign. He knows his plans for you. And maybe God is just giving you a certain amount of children for whatever reason. We don't know. And so sometimes people, what they decide to do is they say, well, we're not having children when we want. So they use their own means. They go out and they use, you know, IVs or they use, you know, all kinds of different tools and instruments of man to try and produce children. But look, God is the one that opens and closes the womb. We should just, you know, respect his ability, his power in that area of our lives. At the same time, though, it could be that there is sin in your life. So I don't want to give you this caveat and just saying, well, I'm not getting blessed with children, but, you know, it's not because I'm doing anything wrong. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter number 7, verse 13. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, and thy wine, and thine oil, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep, and the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you, or among your cattle. So when God's telling the Israelites how he's going to bless them, he says, if you follow all my commandments, there won't be a barren person among you. Zero. So obviously, what happens when you do not follow his commandments? then there are going to be people, be people that are barren among you. So we see as a result of sin, there was barrenness. There was this type of thing. But we can't always just pick and choose, you know, well, this person's in sin, but I'm not in sin. We should just judge ourselves. This is the safest way to behave whenever you're looking at any of these situations. If you feel like there's something wrong in your life, just judge yourself. Be one to pray to God, to ask him, to seek him. And we see this is what Hannah does. Hannah is seeking unto the Lord in her situation. She's not trying to go outside of God's will. She's not trying to go through man's invention. She's going to go and seek the Lord. But it's got to be tough because not only does she have this problem, not only is she going through this for a long time, but she has an adversary, the Bible says, Penina. And it says in verse 6, And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret. And this is the thing. You're going to have adversaries in your life as a woman. As a woman, there's going to be adversaries, and most likely, it's going to be someone close to you, because those are the people that can hurt the most. Those are the people that have the greatest impact on your lives. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I'm going to read for you in Micah. The Bible gives us a warning about some of the people that are close to us in our lives. It says in Micah chapter 7, Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father. The daughter riseth up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. So according to the Bible, you're not even supposed to trust in your friend. You're not even supposed to trust in your own family members. The Bible even warns about the woman that would lay in your own bosom. And here's the thing. You can have someone very close to you that doesn't want to live for God. You can have a sister or a brother or a mother or a dad or an uncle or a grandfather, and they want nothing to do with following God's commandments. They want nothing to do with God. They want nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to make you fret. They're going to try and put guilt and shame on you for loving God, for loving God's commandments. How come every time I talk to you, you just want to talk about the Bible? 
How come every time, you know, we talk about a conflict, you're always using the Bible to support what you believe? How come you, you always go to church three times a week? How come you only listen to Christian music? How come you want to do anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? Look, they're going to constantly attack you and try to put fret on you and try to put worry on you. Oh man, am I talking about the Bible too much? No, no, you're not. Don't let the enemy come and put fret on you for following God's commandments. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, it's a famous verse that people will quote the fact that he's not given us, you know, the spirit of fear. But right before that, he mentions two women, two women of great faith that had a great influence on their son, Timothy on their grandson, Timothy. And we see women have a great influence on their children. They have the single greatest impact on their children because they spend the most time with them. A godly mother will spend the most time with their children if they're doing what the Bible says. And you know what? They're going to have the greatest impact on that child. They're going to be the one that's teaching them the most, that's instructing them the most. And we see such great importance for that mother to not be given over to a spirit of fear. But to say, hey, I have trust in God's commandments. I know what the Bible says. I don't care what my sister says. I don't care what my mother says. I don't care what my father says. I don't care what my brother says. I don't care what any of them say. I know what the Bible says. Amen. And he's not giving me a spirit of fear. And women need to be strong today. Strong in their role. Strong in the job that God's given them. Strong for their children. Why? So they can raise up godly children. Wouldn't you want to be the mother of Samuel? Wouldn't you want to be the mother of David? Wouldn't you want to be the mother of one of these great men of God? Now go back to 1 Samuel. I'm also going to read for you in Matthew, chapter number 10. The Bible emphasizes the point, though, that you will have enemies, that you will have adversaries. And the unfortunate part is that a lot of times it'll be someone very close to you. The Bible says, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. The Bible says that when you love the Lord Jesus Christ, a lot of times you'll have foes even of your own household. I'm not teaching you that because I want you to have enmity with your family. I'm not teaching you that you should decide to put enmity between your family. I'm saying when you decide to have zeal for God, when you have zeal for God's commandments, when you have zeal for the Lord, when you're doing that which is godly, they're naturally going to attack you. They're naturally going to try and put threat on you, and you need to be sound in what you believe. You need to read the Bible for yourself and know what God's Word says so that when they come to attack you, you can have consolation in God's word. You can have the Holy Ghost give you that power, give you that comfort, give you that, you know, condolence. Make sure you know, hey, I'm on the right path. I know what the Bible says. I'm not going to subject myself to that fear. And we see Hannah is a woman who knows her Bible. Hannah is one who knows the scriptures. We're going to see this, you know, throughout this chapter, but look at verse number seven. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, Why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Now, keep your finger here and go to 1 Peter chapter number 3. So what's happening? Well, she's upset. And that's, you know, just obvious. I mean, a woman who desires to have children, who's been struggling for years, this is going to be something that's hard for them. This is going to be difficult for them if they're not having children. There's plenty of women who suffer many nights because they don't have children. Or maybe the only times they've been pregnant, it's ended in a miscarriage. They haven't been able to deliver. This is very difficult. This is very stressful. Women put a lot of blame on themselves for these type of things. It's it's a big deal. We see Hannah, she's struggling. 
And the reality is her husband doesn't get it. Let's just be honest. This guy, he's like, aren't I better than 10 sons? You know, look, this guy has no empathy. He doesn't realize the struggles that his wife's going through. And as men, we can, you know, tolerate a lot more emotion. You know, emotional turmoil doesn't affect us as much. We're much more black and white. And so the Bible instructs us, we need to have certain knowledge as a husband. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. But not only that, he says you need to dwell with them according to knowledge. Now, when you read 1 Samuel, it says that Elkanah loved Hannah. He really did love her. But the problem is he needed a little bit more knowledge. He needed to remember that she's the weaker vessel. She's going to be more subject to certain emotional situations. The fact that they're not having children is obviously affecting Hannah a lot more than it's affecting Elkanah. And so he needs to have that knowledge and realize, hey, my wife is going to be upset sometimes. My wife is going to cry. My wife is going to struggle. My wife is going to have difficulty. And as a man, I need to have that knowledge and I need to empathize with her. I need to dwell with her according to knowledge. I need to be loving and compassionate with her. I need to cry with her. I need to mourn with her. I need to be there to comfort and support her. Now, this doesn't mean that you're weak. This doesn't mean that you're like, I don't know what's going to happen either. And I don't know what's going on. No, you're going to be strong. You need to be a man. You need to, you know, be taking care of the situation. But that doesn't mean at the same time when she's having these kind of struggles and crying, that you're just like, who cares if you have kids? I mean, I'm better than you having 10 kids. Like that's just, he doesn't get it. He's not being empathetic to his wife. Look at verse number nine. Go back to 1 Samuel then. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 16, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. The Bible says to weep with them that weep. So if your wife is really struggling, if your wife is going through some kind of difficult situation, men, you need to be there to empathize with them. If you want to have a good relationship, if you want to draw closer and have more intimacy with your wife, you need to weep with her when she's weeping. Now, sometimes, you know, I'm not, I'm not, not going to have to weep physically. I'm just saying you're, 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 you're matching emotion. You're trying to be empathetic with her. You're being strong for them. Look at verse number nine. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. So did Elkanah really, you know, cheer up his wife? Did he make her feel a lot more happy? No. She's like weeping even more. She's in bitterness of soul. And as a husband, we need to pay attention to our wives, recognize their emotions, and realize, hey, this is a big deal. If a woman were to have a miscarriage, that's not something you just shake off. You just say, get over it, honey. You know, quit crying. Be a man. She's not a man. She's a woman. She's, she's, she's missing that child. You know, women are going to go through difficult situations and so the man needs to be there to support her. Look at verse number 10. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. So keep your finger and go to Numbers chapter number 6. Numbers chapter number six. So a couple things here. First of all, Hannah, she is not blaming the Lord. She's not saying, oh, God hates me and God's wicked and God's evil. No, even in this desperate situation, even the fact that she's bitterness of soul, she's still going to the Lord and saying, Lord, will you please bless me with a child? If you bless me with a child, I vow that he's going to serve you. I vow no razor will come upon his head. Now, where's she coming up with this? You know, the charismatics, they just want to just make things up in their heart and say, this is what God told them. Or, you know, I'm living by faith. You know, God told me to buy that Corvette and to get that five car, you know, garage house and, you know, to get that timeshare and to get that extra vacation home. That's not living by faith. That's living by lust. That's living by the lust of the flesh. Living by faith is when you read God's word, when you read God's commandments and you believe them and you implement those in your life, that's faith. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
So when you hear all the guys in the Bible that were great men of faith, they were actually just following out whatever God told them. God told them those things that they're supposed to do, and then they did them by faith. They weren't making it up as they went. They weren't just deciding what to do willy-nilly out of the own lust of their heart. They were following what God's word said. And even Hannah, she's praying this prayer of faith. She's not making it up as she goes. She's not just deciding something willy-nilly. Look at Numbers chapter 6, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled, and the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father, or for his mother, for his brother, or for his sister, when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto God. The Lord. So the law says there is a provision for someone to make a vow unto God and decide, I just want to be as holy as I possibly can in the flesh to consecrate myself unto the things of God, to be separated unto the things of God. And Hannah knows this. Not only that, we see Manoah with his son, you know, Samson. Samson was another one who had a vow. It was given of the angel, but we saw no razor was to come on his head and he was given great power from God. So Hannah, she knows that story. She knows what the law says. So she decides, well, you know, I haven't had a child yet. Maybe if I said, I'll just dedicate one to the Lord. I'll just do the Nazarite vow from birth. Maybe God will bless me with a child. She says, if you give me a child, Lord, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my whole life and I'm going to invest it in this child to serve you. That's what I want to do with my life. She's, she's humble enough to realize it's not about her she wants to put all of her energy and effort into her son, into her child, and have her son, you know, be lifted up. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter number 1. 1 Samuel chapter number 1. So she's selfless. And that's the great role of a mother. A mother gets to be one who is selfless. Now, I like this because sometimes people look at women as being inferior. But really, when we take a picture of God and we have the Lord Jesus Christ and we have God the Father, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ was in perfect submission to God the Father. Did that make him less? Does that make him, you know, inferior? No. The Lord Jesus Christ, that's the one who we give all the honor and glory and praise unto. That's the name given among men where we may be saved, according to the Bible, right? So because you're submissive to someone doesn't make you lesser than them, necessarily. And with the Lord Jesus Christ, he's an example unto women. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ was in perfect submission to the Father, wives are supposed to be under their husbands. Not because it makes them lesser. It's just a way to show what God's role is for them, is to be submissive. And if you want to be godly as a wife, you're going to be submissive. Now look at chapter, or verse number 12. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. So we even see with Hannah, that she didn't even speak her prayer. She was praying silently. This is another proof of the fact that God can hear your prayers whether it comes out of your mouth or not. Some people have this really stupid idea. They say, you know, they, they attack Romans chapter number 10 that says that you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And they're like, what if someone was mute? And it's like, look, if it's coming out of their heart, whether or not their mouth was able to perform the operation, that's them praying unto the Lord. And we even see God, the Lord, when he's with Abraham and he looks at Sarah, he's like, you laughed. And she's like, I didn't laugh. And he's like, you laughed in your heart. I heard it. So God even knows the things that are coming out of your heart. He knows the things in your mind. And so whenever you're making your prayer, look, God answers this prayer. 
we, we, we go through this chapter, she didn't even open her lips. But the Bible says that her, she opened her soul. She was opening her heart. She, she really meant it. It was something that was really being poured out. She was just refraining her lips. And then Eli's like, you look like you're drunk. <laughs> you know, contrast a godly woman with the daughter of Belial. The daughter of Belial, you know, just, she's a mess. She just looks like, weird. it's like the charismatic movement. These women, they're doing these weird, you know, things, coming into church. And look, a woman that would come into church drunk, what does Hannah think? Hey, that's a daughter of Belial. That's wicked to come into church drunk, to drink. This is something that's, you know, they say, well, drinking, you know, a little bit's okay. I mean, the person that's coming in drunk's considered a reprobate. And you're going to say, oh, just messing around with a little bit, it's okay. I mean, there's basically this quick line where you go from it's great to you're a reprobate. I mean, no, all drinking is wicked, all drinking is sinful. And obviously those that are so drunk and they stumble into church, like the Catholic Pope, you know, the priests, they're, they're handing out the booze in the church. Look, there are many of them are just reprobate, unfortunately. The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Wine will make you look like a mocker. Eli sees her coming in, you know, doing her lips weird, and he's like, it looks like she's doing something stupid. He's like, what are you doing? Get out of here. You're drunk. You know, whatever. But see, he was mistaken. Obviously, wine can have this type of, the same type of effect, but we, you know, that's not what Hannah was doing. So let's look at verse chapter number, or verse number 17. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord in return and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. So we see that Hannah gets this request granted unto her. She finally gets her son. The Lord has you know, answered her petition. She has this son. Now, they were basically going up to worship the Lord yearly. They didn't live, you know, if you're of Ephraim, you don't live necessarily where to serve the Lord near Shiloh. So they have to travel. They travel once a year. And the years come up after she's had her son. The husband's going to go. And she says, you know what? I, I need to stay. I'm going to stay here. I'm not ready, you know, to go. She has the son. And she's loving her son. And not only is she loving him, she's feeding her son. We see, what does she say in verse 22? I will not go up until the child be weaned. Now, for the child to be weaned, that means she's doing something. She's breastfeeding her child. And the Bible emphasizes breastfeeding. Now, go, if you would, to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. Why? Because she loves her son. Breastfeeding is natural. Breastfeeding is what the Bible teaches. And in this weird, wicked society, sometimes they look down on breastfeeding. They look at it as unnatural or not normal, or they'll put shame on you for even breastfeeding. The Bible positively mentions breastfeeding. Look at Genesis chapter 49, verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts, and of the womb. So according to the Bible, God blesses women with the ability to breastfeed their child. It's a blessing from God. And it's all kinds of blessings that come from this. Now go to Psalms chapter 22. Psalms 22. You say, well, my child, they're really special. You know, they need special attention and special food. So I'm not going to give them, you know, breast milk. Because my little toddler, you know, he's so much more you know, better than everybody else. Well, if it's good enough for the Lord Jesus Christ, I think it's good enough for you. Let's look at Psalms 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Now, this is a famous verse because it's what the Lord Jesus Christ said when he was dying on the cross. And so David is speaking by the Holy Ghost words that are the Lord Jesus Christ prophetically. Now, skip down to verse number 8. He trusted on the Lord. 
that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. So this is when they were mocking Jesus Christ. They're saying, you know, he thought he could trust in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Come down from the cross and we'll believe on him. They're just mocking Jesus Christ. But look at verse 9. But thou art he, so who's the he? The Lord Jesus Christ. It's clear from the passage we're all talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. That he took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. So how did the Lord Jesus Christ start off his life? By breastfeeding. He was breastfed baby. And look, if it's good enough for the Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for your kid. Your kid's not as good as the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not as smart as the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't need as much attention as the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, breastfeeding is what God has prescribed. Now go, if you would, to Lamentations chapter 4. It's kind of in the middle of your Bible, right after the big book of Jeremiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. I'll read for you from Isaiah 28. The Bible says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breasts. So the Bible uses this as a positive mention, a positive analogy in lots of different ways. The Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, meaning what? Babies want that milk. Babies desire the breast milk. Look at Lamentations chapter 4, verse 3. Even the sea monsters draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people is become cruel, like the ostriches in the wilderness. So the Bible says even these sea beasts, they're drawing out their breasts. They have enough love to actually feed their child. So the Bible says if you love your child, you'll breastfeed them. Now, I actually looked up a couple articles just to see what does the world say about breastfeeding? Does the world condemn it? Does the world say, you know, that it's good or bad? So I went to the CDC, which is not a Baptist church. It's an acronym, but it's not a Baptist church. They're as far from Baptist church, about as far as you can get. The CDC. But most of the time, you know, they'll use facts. It's usually their interpretation of facts is where they really get a lot of things off. But from the American Academy of Pediatrics, they recommend that infants be exclusively breastfed for about the first six months with continued breastfeeding alongside introduction of appropriate complementary foods for one year or longer. The World Health Organization also recommends exclusively breastfeeding up to six months of age with continued breastfeeding along with appropriate complementary foods up to two years of age or beyond. So that's not my opinion. That's not the Bible's opinion. This is just the secular world. They're just saying from our research, from our science, we say the best thing for a baby is six months exclusive breastfeeding. Then on top of that, even all the way up to two years with supplementing other foods here and there. You know, babies can't eat, you know, steak. I mean, they probably want it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they want that sincere milk. You know, they can't eat the strong meat just yet. They have to graduate to those stages. But a lot of women today don't do this. And even in Texas, I looked at the state of Texas, 50 to 60% of women are breastfeeding up to the six-month period. So if you just look at all babies that are born in Texas, at six months, only 50 to 60% of them are still breastfeeding. So a lot of women are choosing not to breastfeed. And a lot of it comes from this baby boomer generation. They wholesale rejected a lot of the things of the Bible, a lot of the traditions that their fathers that had given unto them. And so they went to the formula. They went to all these other advents. Why? So women could go to work. So women could do all these extra things. They have all this extra time on their hand. They don't have to deal with the baby. But the point of a mother is to be selfless. The point of a mother is to invest in your children, to love your children, and the mother decides, well, I don't want to really do that. It's usually because of their selfish. That's the number one reason. That's usually what happens every single time. Now, sometimes it's a you know, combination of things, being ignorant, not having anybody instructing them, being somewhat selfish, all kinds of different reasons that'll happen. But the Bible makes it clear breastfeeding is godly. Breastfeeding is what a mother will do if she loves her child. Now, I looked up another article. It says 60% of mothers do not breastfeed for as long as they intend to. How long a mother breastfeeds her baby generation is influenced by many factors. So this is the reasons why just online articles say people don't breastfeed, okay? They say they have issues with lactation and latching. Now, here's the thing. If you're not consistent with it, you will have problems. Number two, concerns about infant nutrition and weight. Well, if you really want your kids to be healthy, you're going to breastfeed. That's, that's just how it is. Mother's concerned about taking medications while breastfeeding. Well, I guess they got to get their drugs, right? From the morning sermon, they got to get all those painkillers and all that headache medication, and they don't want it to, you know, influence the baby, so, well, let's just stop breastfeeding. 
unsupportive work policies, and lack of parental leave. So instead of loving their children, instead of giving what their children needs, why well, just got to go to work? I just got to go get that paycheck, and I got to get those extra five bucks or whatever. Cultural norms or lack of family support. And look, I think it's usually a combination of these type of things. But we see because, you know, the, the parents don't pass down godly traditions, godly morals, godly instruction, God's commandments, women will decide to not do that which is godly. Not only that, unsupportive hospital practices and policies. So there's a lot of different reasons. But look, if you have God's clear commandments, it's easy. And there's a lot of benefits that come with breastfeeding. But just to make sure we understand, even the state lifts up breastfeeding, even the state of Texas. I looked at their, you know, legal regulations, the Health and Safety Code, Title II. It says in Section 165.001, it says the legislature finds that breastfeeding a baby is an important and basic act of nurture that must be encouraged in the interest of maternal and child health and family values. In compliance with the breastfeeding promotion program established under the Federal Children Nutrition Act of 1966, the legislator recognizes breastfeeding as the best method of infant nutrition. So according to the CDC, the best way for you to feed your child is breastfeeding. According to the state of Texas, the best way to feed your child is breastfeeding. According to God's word, the best thing is breastfeeding. So here's my question. Why do people not do it? It's just every single area, they're all saying it's the best thing. Not only that, you even have protected rights. It says you have a right to breastfeed. In section 165.002 in the state of Texas, it says a mother is entitled to breastfeed her baby in any location in which the mother is authorized to be. So anywhere where a mother is at, as long as you're not you know, infringing on your, you know, where you're supposed to be, like you didn't break in someone's house, you, know, you didn't rob somebody's house or something, as long as you're allowed to be there, you're allowed to be breastfeeding, according to the state of Texas. So don't let someone shame you. People sometimes shame women for their breastfeeding in public, breastfeeding at a restaurant, breastfeeding at church, breastfeeding wherever. People put shame on you. Now, I want to do the exact opposite. Wherever you're at, you are welcome to breastfeed. If you're in the sanctuary, you're welcome to breastfeed. Now, obviously, we provide a mother baby room, but that's more for your toddler to crawl around or whatever. Look, I, I encourage women to breastfeed, and they can do whatever they want. Some people make them wear like a blanket. You know, they got to put on a hijab or whatever while they're breastfeeding. And, you know, hey, I'm breastfeeding over here. You know, don't look at me. Look, my wife's never done that. She's never used a blanket. You don't have to wear a blanket to come to church. You know, that's kind of ridiculous. Obviously, I don't like eating under a blanket. I've never really tried it too much, but I don't like it. So you're welcome to do whatever's comfortable with you. And don't let someone shame you. You say, well, pa you know, Pastor Shelley, he says I can breastfeed wherever I want. Amen. That's what, that's the, that's what this church is going to say, all right? Because I don't want anybody to feel like, well, I don't want to do it. We better bring a bottle to church. No, you breastfeed that baby because that's what's loving. What's loving is to feed that child what God has provided for them. I don't want to put any barriers. I want to make it easy to do. That's what God's Word teaches. Now, why would you, you know, not do it? Or why would you decide to, uh, do, to breastfeed? I'm going to give you even more reasons. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not just one reason today. There's two, there's three. I'm going to give you more. Because if you do the alternative, then you get bottles. And look, me and my wife, we've done both, okay? We, the first one, you know, if you say, what's wrong with Clayton? There's lots of things. No, <laughs> the first one's just the trial and error kid. Now, he was, he was formula fed for majority of his life, okay? So we had the bottles. You know what the bottles are? They're stinky. Man, that formula smells so terrible. It is the worst smell. It makes me want to vomit every time I had to clean it. And you have to clean it multiple times a day because they eat all the time. They're constantly eating. So you're constantly washing out these bottles. They smell terrible. They're awful. Not only that, women will constantly maybe do pumping. So maybe they don't use the formula, but they're just doing pumping. Look, pumping is going to make you go on double time because not only do you have to do the pumping, now you got to do the feeding. So you're like doubling all of your work. And look, babies eat a lot, especially if you're feeding on demand. So if you're doing pumping, you're basically just a cow laid up. I mean, you're just you're pumping, then you're feeding, then you're pumping, then you're feeding. It's like you don't get any rest. There's not any benefit to it. Not only that, your production is reactive. A mother who's breastfeeding, your production is reactive. Some people say, well, I'm losing production. Well, then just pick up, you know, the eating. Let the kid eat more. 
Spend more time eating. Don't put him in a blanket. You know, don't, don't, don't put him in the hijab. You know, maybe he'll eat a little bit longer and you'll get more of the milk coming because your body will respond to whatever's happening. If your child starts to eat more, your production will pick up. If you stop, you know, feeding them, if you start doing what God has taught you to do, then your production will decline. Not only that, if you decide to not use breast milk, you're just going to use the formula. I looked up, we bought the Similac Advance, the, the non-GMO version, okay? For 1.45 pounds, it's $26.99 for one little, you know, bucket or whatever. And we would usually go through four a month. So we're buying about four, maybe even more, maybe a little bit less, but average about four. So that's about $116.87 a month that you're just throwing away because if you breastfed, guess what? It's this much money. Amen. It's this much money to breastfeed. You don't have, I mean, you don't have to do it, buy anything. That's $700 for six months. So if you want to save $700, breastfeed. How about for the year? It's $1,400. $1,400 if you're just buying the formula, buying the formula. Look, it's expensive. There's not a benefit to not do it. I don't, I don't see why you would want to do it. Now, most of the reason you get pressure from who? You get pressure from Penina. You get pressure from that adversary, that family member saying, oh, you're going to breastfeed? Oh, you're going to breastfeed in the, in the house? You're going to breastfeed in public? Yes, I am. Yes, my wife is. Yes, we're going to do what God said. Yes, we're going to do what the state of Texas said. Yeah, we're going to do what the CDC said in this one. Not in you know, a lot of other things. Now go back to 1 Samuel chapter 1. First Samuel chapter 1, look at verse 23. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. So keep your finger here and go to Numbers chapter 30. And we're almost done with the chapter, but I just want to really hit those points. Because, you know, whenever you get to do a Bible study, you just get to hit points you wouldn't normally want to hit or think about hitting. So we're just going to hit the things that, you know, the Bible, you know, lays out for us. That just really makes clear. And we see that Hannah, she has great love for her child. She's very selfless for her child. So what does she decide to do? She decides to breastfeed her child, doesn't she? I don't even know what other options they had. A lot of times the other option in the Bible, you see they get a maid. Or they get a nurse, is what they would call it. And the nurse would be the one that would feed the child. So we see they're shifting the love to the nurse. The nurse is the one loving the child. The nurse is the one building the bond with the child. The nurse is the one that has the affection towards the child. So then the mom could be an ostrich mom. Go do whatever she, gallivant on the town, and you know, go shopping, and get her job, and wear her pantsuit, and go, go be president, you know, whatever. <laughs> Numbers chapter 30, look at verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So now, Hannah had made a vow unto the Lord, that she was going to raise her child to the Lord. She was going to lend her child unto the Lord. But the thing is, is Elkanah had the ability to change that vow. Elkanah had the ability to override that vow. And when she told him at this point... When we read the story, I don't think Elkanah necessarily knew yet because she's the one praying to God in secret. We see she only tells Eli. So I don't know. But I'm thinking at that moment was a moment for Elkanah to make a decision. Is this going to really stand? Because if we skip down, it says if a man vow vow, he's, he's bound. OK, but look at verse three. If a man also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, and her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or her bonds wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand, and the Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed her. So it's like, Hey, I, Dad, I promised my friends I'm going to the Taylor Swift concert on Friday. No, you're not. No, you're not going to see that concert. So, but I promised. Well, guess what? God will forgive you, but you're not going. Go, get, go back in your room. Read your Bible a little bit more. Look at verse 6. And if she had at all an husband, so this is not Hannah, this is Hannah. And if she had all an husband when she vowed or uttered out of her lips, wherewith she bound her soul, and her husband heard it, and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, then her vows shall stand, and her bonds are which she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, 
Then he shall make her vow which she vowed, and that which she uttered with her lips, wherewith she bound her soul, of none effect, and the Lord shall forgive her. So, in Hannah's situation, I believe we probably came across this where she's telling him, nope, I'm not going to go. Because he, he didn't already know that. He's like, why aren't you coming? You, you know, they're having this dialogue. She's like, I'm not going to go yet until I've weaned him. Then I'm going to lend him unto the Lord. And we see Elkanah, he doesn't change the vow in the day. He says, it'll be what you said. We'll let the Lord confirm his word. This is what's going to happen. And so we see it's important who you marry. It's important who you marry. A woman that says, I want to serve the Lord, but I'm going to marry this derelict. I'm going to marry this loser that doesn't love God, that isn't going to put God first. We can see that he could trump a lot of her desires, a lot of her wishes to serve God. We see it's so important who you marry. Now, Cana might not have been a beacon of, you know, godliness. He might have been the, the, the most godly person on the planet, but at least he loved the Lord enough to go service every single year. He went to the you know, sacrifice every single year. We see he has some love for the Lord. And we see when she makes this great vow to raise her child for the Lord specifically, he doesn't disallow it. He's willing to allow it. Think about how many atheist men would say, you're not going to church. You're not taking your kids to church. You're not going to read the Bible. You're not going to do this. Look, it's important that you marry a believer. It's important that you're equally yoked together, even as a woman. The woman is, if you're going to be godly, you're going to submit unto your husband in everything, the Bible says. And we see with Hannah, she gets this great opportunity with her husband to not disallow her vow. Go back to 1 Samuel, we'll finish this chapter. So we see, Hannah is basically, you know, such a godly woman that she starts off the book of 1 Samuel in a way where she puts all her trust in the Lord. All of her reliance is in the Lord. She knows her Bible. And a woman who knows her Bible that is subject unto God is a dangerous person against the enemy, is a dangerous person for the devil. And so he wants to attack her. And there's so much attack on godly women today. They're so rare. They're so hard to find. Don't let someone attack you without knowing God's word. You need to know God's word. You say, is it important for your wife to know the Bible? Yes, it is. Yes, it's very important for her to know the Bible, to understand what we believe, to be rooted and grounded in the faith, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And look, when she's home with the children, she's abounding in the work of the Lord. When she's teaching her children the Bible, she's abounding in the work of the Lord. It's not only soul winning. Look, soul winning is the first works. Soul winning is the, the heartbeat of the church. But you know what? There's a lot of God's commandments in the Bible. And you know what? For women, he wants them to be home to guide the house, to bear children, to raise godly children. And we see if you raise a Samuel, you're going to turn this whole world upside down with the gospel. You say, oh, how am I going to do it? I don't get to go soul winning as much as my husband. Well, I haven't won a Samuel to the Lord. I haven't won, you know, some guy tearing up the world yet. You could raise one. You have more likelihood that you could raise a Samuel than I'm going to go win one. And I'm not saying to be defeated. Look, obviously I should try to do the same thing spiritually to beget, you know, Onesimus in my bonds to raise up a Titus or a Timothy or whatever. But at the same time, women can raise up great men of God in their own household. Let's finish this chapter. Look at verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her and with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh when the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. He shall worship, and he worship the Lord there. So go to Proverbs 22. This is the last place I'll have you turn. She sacrifices everything for her child. She's an epitome of selflessness. She puts down her own life, her own wishes, her own desires for her son to serve the Lord for her son to be godly. And we see that's what God wants for women, women to be selfless. And look, men, they have to lead. Men, they have to do all kinds of things. Men can also be selfless in a lot of ways. But we see women, they have a greater role in being selfless, putting so many other people first. That's why we see the Proverbs 31 woman, everything she's doing for other people. She's getting up early, why? For her house, to feed her house. She's sewing clothes, what? For her house. She's doing, she's making great, nice clothing so her husband can look good when he goes out into the gate. 
The husband gets the praise. The husband gets the glory. The husband gets all the attention. It's the husband's name. My wife joked, she says, look, you started a church and you put your name all over it. <laughs> look, the men, sometimes it looks like they're getting more attention. They're getting more of the outward appearance. But look, that's not how God sees things. And God doesn't look the way that man looks. And he looks at a woman who's going to be sold out for the Lord. Who t who, who's the greatest influence in 1 Samuel? Is it Elkanah or is it Hannah? It's Hannah that kicks off the book of 1 Samuel. Look at Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We see the mother is so important. We should never de-emphasize the mother. And as we go through 1 Samuel, we're going to read great stories of war, of battle, of triumph, of friendship, of all kinds of great things, great men of God. And guess what? We should always remember it started with Hannah. It started with a woman who feared the Lord, who loved the Lord. And even though she went through a really hard life, she's constantly being provoked by her adversary. She's been barren for a long time. She's gone through all kinds of struggles. Her husband's not empathetic with her. Her husband's sharing her with another woman. That's got to be tough. I mean, this woman is not having the easiest life. You say, my life isn't that easy. Well, she still decided, you know what? I'm going to still put all my trust in the Lord. I'm going to still desire to put all my faith in his promises. I'm going to study my Bible. She wasn't sitting at home just, you know, poor me. She was reading her Bible. She knew what her Bible said. So that when she came to the house of the Lord, she prayed in the Lord for a child and he hearkened unto her and he gave her that child. And then when she got the child, she followed through. She selflessly put the child first. She loved the child, and Samuel goes on to be a great prophet of the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you so much for your promises. Thank you for being the ultimate example, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for men and for women, for your submission unto the Father in all things, that women can also be submissive unto their own husbands. I thank you for the, the great and important role that you've given to women and how you highlighted this great story of history through Hannah, and you teach us the importance of women, the great impact they can have on a country, on a nation, on the world, on the kingdom of God, if they would just submit unto your commandments, if they would just submit unto your word, and they get to do the greatest thing, they get to love their children. I pray that you would just bless all the women in this room, and that they would decide to put all their faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.